A nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to Season 4. What would you do if you purchased land and wanted to celebrate somebody's birthday by camping on said land that rightfully belonged to you, only for it to be pitted against you in the worst way? What would you do if, despite gut feelings from a family member, if you found yourself becoming buddies with a would-be stranger, only to be in a predicament with them? After a celebratory camping trip goes horrifically awry, there is one survivor in a party of seven, six who had succumbed to murder. Join us as we tell you about the victims, the survivor, and the territorial psychopath who committed these heinous acts. I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And in Nefarious Nightmare Presents, he had a history. Mass murder in Tennessee Colony. The following case is another one that seems different to ones we normally cover on the surface, but once you get into it, you'll see how it matches up. And this one was a suggestion by my coworker and friend Emerald Arista. Thank you so much, Emerald. For background, we asked people for case suggestions and she went on to say, quote, I have one. The murders of the Camp family. I believe another family was involved. It happened in Tyler, Texas in 2015. One of the sons, Austin Camp, was dating a family friend of mine. I never heard the whole story, and it always bothered me, so I don't have much. The girl who was dating Austin Camp had told us that his father and stepmother brought land out of Tyler, Texas. The girl and Austin lived out of state at the time, and they came back to Texas to visit family. The family had invited her to go out, but she decided to stay in town to see her side of the family before going back out of state. And this is where I get lost, but the man who murdered them had befriended the family before killing them invites them over for dinner or something along those lines then later that night killed them all in total six i believe one family member survived she hid in the woods at night end quote okay so we don't know if we should thank you emerald or have courtney yell at you later because this was a pretty deep dive that we didn't even realize would be such we found so many resources for this which we have attached to the show notes I encourage you to all read through those as well because they were really eye-opening to say the least. What gets us is that this is a case that practically happened in our backyard and while I've heard of it, Courtney hadn't. And it just goes to show you that some cases are really way under the radar. Nothing about this is fun, but it's pretty fascinating that we're both surprised that it hasn't been covered more. With that, a ton of time and energy was put into this. So we hope that we can help paint the story for you better. But even more so, we want to tell you about all the victims and the survivor first, because they are the most important part of any case we cover. So we start with Carl Johnson. Carl Johnson was 77 at the time that he was murdered. He was born and raised in Connecticut and was considered a rugged individualist. He served in the United States Navy during the 1950s. And when he wasn't serving, he loved traveling and taking part in road trips with his motorcycle. He and his wife, Cynthia, lived typical life as retirees. They retired from their jobs at the University of Maine at Farmington. Carl had started as a custodian and worked there from 1970 to 1999, ending in the personnel department, and it's been said that the positions they held were non-academic. They found joy in taking part in road trips in their Silver Airstream Safari travel trailer. His boss at the University of Maine, Bob Lawrence, remembered Carl as a soft-spoken and caring man who always drove a motorcycle with his wife Cynthia in the sidecar. He met his wife, who we will talk about in a bit, in a computer class that they were both in, and he had asked her out on a date. He's remembered chivalrous and outgoing and was often the center of attention, with Cynthia saying, quote, even on that first date to go to a dance at the American Legion, he was singing away. I liked that. 
I had never so easily felt comfortable with someone. We were friends for life, end quote. Cynthia also remembers Carl by saying, quote, Carl was the interesting one. There was no such thing as sitting down during the day for him, end quote. This goes to show that Carl wanted to live a full and active life and that he carried both care and humor with him at all times, along with a love of the outdoors. He was also remembered by friends and colleagues as, quote, the most wonderful person you will ever meet and a joyous person full of life. He inevitably proposed to Cynthia, and a few years after they had gotten married, they settled down in a gated area within Hillsborough County, Texas, which was made especially for Airstream owners. It was rural life indeed, and lots of vegetation, and the Johnsons loved it. Quote, he would go out and chop down trees in the spring, end quote. Cynthia remembers fondly. In the winter, we, they had maple trees, and they would even tap the trees. Days prior to the murders, Cynthia and Carl were celebrating their 42nd anniversary by eating Chinese food in Waxahachie. His daughter, Hannah Johnson, who at the time was 40 years old, was an insurance adjuster that worked in Fort Worth. She loved gardening, animals, and she felt like she belonged in Texas. A bit about her, she was an attractive female. In fact, many people remembered her as such, with her aunt saying, quote, she was nice looking, and that she and her fiance made a nice looking couple. Before moving to Texas, she earned her early childhood education degree from the University of Maine in Orono and was a member of the Chi Omega sorority. She lived in Boston with friends before moving to Southern California, and then to the Dallas-Fort Worth area to be close to her parents in 2009 after her son, K.J. Johnson, was born in Boston. This is where she met her loving fiancé, Thomas Kemp, who is described as a George Clooney lookalike. His brother Todd said, quote, They hit it off. They just celebrated their fifth anniversary living together. The two planned to get married. Hannah was described by close friends as shy, loved to garden, animals, and exercise which Thomas Kemp also loved. And just like her mom and dad, she once owned an Airstream travel trailer. Her mother, Cynthia, said, quote, She rode a yellow bus to school from her childhood home outside Farmington, Maine. End quote. Growing up, she played soccer and loved to bicycle. Hannah was really big on exercise and staying in shape. Some remember that, instead of sitting down to eat to lunch during her lunch breaks, that she worked out. It didn't matter, rain or shine, she was working out. She also was able to start a garden in the yard of her spacious Mithilonian home that she shared with her fiancé. Despite the appearance of her dedication to a healthy lifestyle, she was sweet, empathetic, compassionate, and loved animals. In fact, her mom remembered an instance where Hannah nursed an injured cat back to health after risking her own life to rescue the cat from a crazy yet typical traffic in Fort Worth. Quote, she just can't stand to see anything hard happen to helpless animals. End quote. Her mom added. Her son, Cade Johnson, also known as KJ, was just six at the time and was remembered as a delight to be around. He was an adorable little blonde six-year-old who attended LaRue Miller Elementary School in Midlothian. His favorite color was camouflage and was described as shy just like his mom, but... He was coming out of it quicker than his mom did. His grandmother remembered a time where our brave and courageous little friend crossed the street to introduce himself to a group of kids that he didn't know just to play with them. KJ frequented the Airstream community in Hillsborough often. Even though you have to be 45 or older to live in what is described as a home base for avid travelers, children often visited parents and grandparents. This would be true for KJ, Cynthia, and Carl. KJ was often visiting or camping with his grandparents and was very much a part of this community. Mariah Guerin, who we will mention later, she runs the community and says that this is about 50 miles south of Fort Worth. He would ride his bike around the cul-de-sac. Everyone in the park knew him, she had said. Hannah's fiancé, Thomas Camp, was 46 at the time. He grew up in Illinois and was the middle child of three boys. He's described as level-headed and smart and started working life very early to become self-sufficient. His younger brother, Todd, remembers, quote, He was the only guy I knew in high school who had his own apartment. He never asked anybody for nothing, 
end quote. He married at a young age where he and his wife, Karina, had four sons and lived in several different states before settling down in Middle Othian to be near relatives and friends. That marriage did not work out, but he was dead set on rebuilding his life and having family gatherings often. Although he wasn't KJ's biological father, he treated him like one of his own, making sure that KJ was always present at community activities and always took him to school. And much like Hannah, Thomas had a love for the outdoors and for living a healthy lifestyle and staying fit. Relatives joked that he was so conscientious about his diet that he would count out exactly 10 almonds if he wanted a snack. He and Hannah were a match made in heaven and the three were indeed a tight-knit family. Hannah and KJ were his world. He was in general sales and a finance manager for Graf Chevrolet in Middle Othian, and his smile certainly matched. It was described as a trademark smile. Robert Rippey, the Graf Chevy general manager, said, quote, He had a signature smile that was always on his face. Tom was absolutely loved by everyone who worked with him. End quote. Thomas was your typical had a smile that lit up the room type. Thomas Camp had two sons with Karina Luhambo, Nathan Camp, who was 23, and Austin Camp, who was 21. Although both Nathan and Austin came from an earlier marriage, everyone was super close. Like, everybody was inseparable. The Johnsons and Thomas Camp were from Dallas. Austin and Nathan Camp were visiting from Oceanside, California. Both boys were career-driven and health-focused and loved the outdoors like the rest of the family. Nathan was known to be a joyful prankster. His uncle remembers a time where, during an interview, Nathan had said that he likes to go to Walmart on his free time to make prank announcements. They didn't call him back, but he did find a job. He worked for a mobile health tech company that provides cell phone service to senior citizens. He had planned to grow in the community and had been recently promoted. His mother, Karina, remembered him as the most honorable, beautiful, kind person. He's never been in trouble. And she said that while he had always been heavy set, he planned to get in shape, saying that January he started a diet and planned to lose 100 pounds by the following year. She also remembered a time where, before he left California to visit with his family for his birthday, she video recorded him showing his excitement in the kitchen by doing a little dance. It's easy to picture, given his perpetually playful nature. Austin Camp was also known as Slim to friends and family. He had long hair, usually pulled back, and bright blue eyes with a smile to match. He was a shy kid who attended Plano West High School and then went on to study to become a real estate agent. He wanted to start his own company with his mom. They actually wanted to incorporate all the brothers into this business venture. He had dreams of changing the world. Austin was considered an entrepreneur in the making with a clear and bright career path. Austin was 21 at the time that he was murdered. When talking about her sons, Karina says, quote, We've never been apart for more than a few days. My four sons and I are way more than mom and sons. They're the reason I was born, end quote. The four boys often had family dinners in California with their mom, which both boys were there the night before they left for Texas to spend time camping and hunting with their dad. Life was indeed good for both the camps and the Johnsons. However, a week prior to the murders, Sheriff responded to a 911 call and were dispatched out to a gas station along US 287, where they would pull over and arrest William Mitchell Hudson. This would be a mile away from the Kim's gas station in Tennessee Colony. Hudson had assaulted a cashier at this gas station who had warned others not to come in. He had been witnessed as getting into an altercation with another man. A gun was seen dropping from Hudson's clothing when he was pushed to the floor while not letting the man leave. The sheriff's deputy had handcuffed Hudson, placed him in their police cruiser, and searched his red pickup truck where they found in the front seat a 22 caliber and a 45 caliber revolvers. The deputy described Hudson as, quote, very uncooperative by cursing and talking very loudly. End quote. On his way to Anderson County Jail, we will talk a bit more about Hudson in a little while. A brief geography and history lesson to explain Tennessee Colony. It's an unincorporated community in Anderson County, which is located within the Palestine, Texas micropolitan area. It's approximately 14 miles northwest of Palestine and northwestern 
Anderson County. More well-known cities near this area include Tyler, which is something of a college town since it is home to UT of Tyler. And then there's Corsicana, Ennis, Palestine, and Henderson, to name a few. According to the Handbook of Texas, the community had a population of just 300 in the year 2000. It's named Tennessee Colony after it was founded in 1847. A large group of settlers from Tennessee and Alabama had arrived in the area. They named the settlement Tennessee Colony after their home state. So, the birthday party. The Friday night prior to the murders on November 13th, 2015, started out relatively uneventful, except for long-awaited plans coming to fruition for a birthday party at Hannah and Thomas's home in Middle Othian. Thomas had left from work at 5 p.m. that day with both Nathan and Austin, as well as Hannah and KJ, Carl and Cynthia. Nathan was about to turn 24 after all, and that this year his birthday fell on Thanksgiving Day. The family really wanted to do it big this year for his birthday, and since everyone was huge on the outdoor life, the couple had to purchase some land on the Tennessee colony and then planned a camping trip. The camping trip was a welcome and appreciated gesture, a birthday present to Nathan from Hannah and Thomas. Everyone was really excited for the weekend ahead on a newly purchased land in the great outdoors. The party was fun, everyone had a blast, and they were ready for life to continue being pleasant. The video that Nathan's mother took of him doing his joyful dance that we were talking about earlier would prove to be a bittersweet memory of a beautiful night that would precede a tragic day. On Saturday, November 14th, 2015, life of the Camps and Johnsons would be forever changed. So William Hudson was born July 3rd, 1982 in Anderson County. He wasn't very well known around the area prior to the murders. What is known about him is that he was especially close to his father, who was described as an avid outdoorsman and retired United Pacific Railroad engineer who passed away a year prior to all of this from cancer at the age of 60. William dropped out of high school after his junior year, and classmates remembered that he loved hunting, specifically white-tailed deer. He had one sibling, a sister, and he was great at tennis and basketball. One resident of Tennessee Colony, Charlie Smith, described William as a nice, normal, and respectful kid when he was younger, always pleasant to be around, and came from a good, down-to-earth family. He had a great relationship with his parents. Charlie owns the Roadhouse Package Store, which is a liquor store where he would see William now and then. He remembers that at one point, he got a really religious and also got married. Several people remember William as harmless, albeit moody, and had a quick temper, especially when drunk. A neighbor of his remembered William as a nice guy when he wasn't drunk, and that he was occasionally goofy and down to earth. Sometimes he was seen shooting in the air or at an old washing machine that they kept in the yard. The neighbors also remembered a few times when William had drunk himself to the point of passing out, and he'd lie on the back porch with dogs who would lick his face until he woke up. Sometimes he just seemed upset for no good reason. Despite the fact that he dropped out of high school and ended up getting his GED, and knew a lot about motors and the like. He even worked in the bus maintenance barn at Palestine ISD for a few years. There are pictures of William floating around holding his newborn baby girl and looking like a loving and doting father. This right here is proof that things aren't always as they seem because his ex-wife, Katrina, remembers him as mean, angry, abusive, and dangerous. She married him in 2004, and they had their daughter in 2006. And then, very soon after that she put a protective order out on him, saying that he made a death threat against her and their baby. Now, I know this is going to get confusing because there's a Karina in the story and there's a Katrina in the story, but just for levity, Karina is the ex-wife of Thomas Camp, and Katrina, Kat, was the ex-wife of William. So... Katrina had said that William had a drinking problem and suspected that he was abusing drugs as well. She noticed that his temperament was worse by the day and was increasingly physically violent. There were three domestic abuse reports that were helpful in a case for this protective order. She said that he was physically and mentally abusive, threatened to kill her and her 17-year-old dog, 
and said that he would get away with it and caused her to be deathly afraid for her life. This protective order would prohibit him from being in possession of any firearms or ammo, and he was banned from being within 1,000 feet of her home or work. With all of this, he indeed had a history of anger, drunkenness, and even violence. The day of the murders, William stopped on in to the Roadhouse Package Store. Charlie Smith, the owner, wasn't there that day, but the employees who were there say that William seemed pleasant and in a good mood. He gave no indication that he was upset by anything, and things went as normal. Meanwhile, the Camps and the Johnsons, a party of seven, would head out to Tennessee Colony to the campsite with their Airstream in tow. Cindy and Carl were the first to show up, and when they arrived, and despite the fact that they now owned this land, they were met with a troublesome padlock that required bolt cutters to open. At the same time, their truck and Airstream got stuck in the mud. Tensions and anticipation were understandably high, and with that, Cindy and Carl got into a pretty heated argument, which prompted a man to drive up to them. He seemed angry that the couple were disturbing the peace, as it were, but then noticed that the couple needed help getting their truck and Airstream out of the mud. So he left and then he returned with his tractor. Around this time, around four in the afternoon, he was helping them get the truck free when Hannah, Austin, Nathan, and KJ arrived with their ATV and trailer. The man who had been helping them was William Hudson, and he lived on a property next to this one. The group offered to pay William for his help, but he declined it and said to them that he wanted to just sit down and have a beer instead. They all sat around, hung out, everyone was chatting about the plans, and in the middle of this, it was brought up that the padlock had to be cut off the gate for them to access the property. William got really pissed off and considered this to be a disrespectful act. He told them that he intended to buy the property and obviously taken aback. Carl and Cindy had apologized for cutting the padlock. Carl even tried to smooth things over and continued conversations with him as though they were friends. Despite all of this, William felt like he was entitled to this property as it had apparently existed within his own family for several generations. But the thing is, the property had gone up for sale, but William was unable to purchase it at the time. But first of all, how in God's name would the family have known that he wanted to purchase this land when they didn't even know him prior to November 14th of 2015, for one thing, and for another, the family had already purchased this land, so they were well within their rights to be there. The unauthorized padlock had no business being there, so of course they cut through it. It was their property. And I say this because we're starting to see a motive here. Hannah had a weird feeling about William and really wanted him to leave, but only expressed so privately. We always tell you that you all need to trust your gut. And this was Hannah trusting hers as we would unfortunately come to find out. So it gets to be about eight in the evening and everyone, including William, is sitting around a campfire. Tom finally arrived in Hannah's car. There was a need for more firewood, so William, Tom, Austin, Nathan, and KJ all left to go get some more while Carl, Hannah, and Cynthia stayed behind to make dinner. It has been said that KJ was excited to go with the guys and wanted to be included. So, of course, they had him tag along. As Cindy, Carl, and Hannah were making dinner, they heard gunshots, but they didn't think much of it, just assumed that it was people nearby fooling around. They shrugged it off and continued when eventually William returned alone in the ATV and began talking to Carl. Hannah felt like something was off, ran over to Tom's truck and began pointing. She had discovered something horrifying at the back of the ATV. It's at this point when William exited the ATV and started shooting at them, killing both Hannah and Carl. Thankfully, Cynthia was not shot as she had survived this attack by hiding in the woods for several hours. Sadly, during this time, Nathan and Austin's great aunt was preparing a Thanksgiving dinner for them to have early once everyone he had returned. Turkey, dressing, sweet potatoes, cranberries, relish. After not hearing from the family, whom they had been texting and keeping in contact with, they went on to have the dinner without them. She was preparing the dinner for them to have an early because of the following day, Nathan and Austin would be returning back to California. And on that following Monday morning, November 16th, Tom did not show up for work, which was very unusual. Phone calls were made to Tom's phone, but they all went straight to voicemail. 
People were trying to reach this family, and nobody was getting anywhere. Meanwhile, on that Sunday, Cynthia finally got up the courage to call 911 after hiding in the woods for several hours. She had heard two gunshots and witnessed Carl fall on the steps of the trailer. She had said that William brought everyone over to the woods and then proceeded to chase two of them into the camper trailer. The warrant stated, quote, Cynthia continued to hide hearing multiple gunshots and remaining in hiding until she felt that it was safe to move. Police began to scour the area, and they found Hannah and Carl were dead in the camper trailer. Hannah was discovered nude from the waist down, although a sexual assault examination did not detect William's DNA inside of Hannah's body. They did find her DNA in the crotch area of William's boxers. They continued searching and found William's tractor, which they had visible bloodstains on it. The rest of the family had not been found yet, but they did apprehend and quickly arrest William, who had visible bloodstains all over him. The next day, on Monday at around 1.15 p.m., a law enforcement dive team subsequently recovered Tom's, Nathan's, Austin's, and KJ's bodies from a stock pond behind William's mother's home. The medical examiner who conducted the six victims' autopsies testified that they died from injuries that included gunshot wounds, and extreme blunt force trauma. The aunt who was preparing the Thanksgiving dinner, as well as Tom's work and anyone who had been close with them, would soon be notified that their family would not be returning and everyone would be completely heartbroken. Sheriff Greg Taylor, who was out with the officers scouring the area, said that the murder scene was traumatizing and, quote, straight out of a horror movie. It's like something you'd watch on Halloween night, end quote. Neighbors had heard gunshots the night of the murders, but didn't really think much of it, as people often like to hunt in that area, and William himself was always shooting in that area. One neighbor, a high school senior at the time, told investigators that she heard gunshots from the same area of the murders that evening while she was in her backyard, checking on her pet pig. She assumed someone was hog hunting and had an accident. The gunshots didn't alarm her due to it being hunting season. She did realize that 10 or 15 shots were fired, and then she heard a man screaming, Stop. Stop. Please stop. Followed by a few more shots and then silence. Followed by a truck driving away. A motive wasn't immediately evident, as nobody suspected William of doing such horrific things despite his history of arrests, drinking, and anger issues. Thomas Kemp's ex-wife, Karina, did have a possible explanation, though, which really seems to align with everything. Apparently, William didn't know this family prior to November 14th, 2015, right? Karina said that the sale of the campsite to the camps in August, three months before the murders, really may have set William Hudson off. Her theory was that he was pissed off that an outsider owned the campsite which he had enjoyed due to its population of deer. Remember, he really liked to deer hunt. So Thomas Camp, not knowing that anyone would be angry about this, had went ahead and placed the lock on the fence separating the property. But William cut the lock and took possession of the land without anyone knowing about it until the family noticed the aforementioned unauthorized padlock and used bolt cutters to remove it. If you're thinking that this sounds like a case of cats and dogs peeing somewhere to mark their territory, Trust me, we are on the same page. The thing is, the camps rightfully owned this campsite. After all, William thought that the land was owned by his father and that it was sold right out from under him. He'd been offered to buy the land when it went up for sale by Bonnie Wolverton, which is William's mother's cousin, who did own the campsite. William's father didn't actually ever own the land. It was held in trust by... Bonnie Wolverton as trustee of Lucille H. Wolverton Living Trust. So the Hudson and Wolverton families have a long history of marrying into one another, and the land was commonly regarded as their family's property according to the locals, but she said that she decided to sell the property when Hudson's father had passed and listed it on the real estate market after other nearby property owners showed absolutely no interest in it. She remembered William showing interest a month or two before the camps purchased it, but Unfortunately, he didn't have the money to actually purchase it, but he didn't even try to expand on this interest. Like he wasn't pushing for it or anything. He didn't even ask for any financial assistance and evidently he could have, but he didn't. 
And he just didn't seem phased at all when he found out that the camps purchased it in August for $29,600. But despite all this, despite the fact that the ownership never existed, William Hudson firmly believed that the land was his and his alone. Sheriff Greg Taylor said that William did not resist arrest physically, but had been extremely uncooperative with the investigation and refused to talk. He was charged with just one count of murder at the time, and this charge was a solidarity charge for expendency. He was being held in Anderson County Jail on a $2.5 million bond and in solitary confinement because of the nature of his crime. So at this time, while the case was still being investigated with assistance from both the Texas Rangers and Palestine PD, Sheriff Taylor said that the crime scene was still being processed five days after the murders. Quote, there's a lot of physical evidence to process and that's what's happening. And that's what's been happening since the day it began, the day we got the 911 call. District Attorney Allison Mitchell added that the massacre was the quote, single most horrific crime in Anderson County's modern history and promised to prosecute William Hudson to the fullest extent of the law. And as a reminder to everybody listening, capital murder in Texas is punishable by the death penalty. The only survivor of this terrible mass murder was Cynthia Johnson by hiding from him in the nearby woods. Take a moment to imagine what she must have been through, what she still is probably going through. Imagine the fear. It's horrifying. It's like being sought out by some unknown evil force. And to top it off, at the time, anyway, you have zero idea as to why. Imagine going one minute celebrating a birthday, an amazing birthday present of a camping with your family, to the next, your entire family is murdered. I can't even begin to imagine her pain and trauma, but in many ways, thank God she survived to be able to obtain justice for her murdered family and to be able to identify William Mitchell Hudson. The trial began November 1st, 2017, where William pled not guilty. Now, just to let y'all know, this is probably the shortest trial I have personally ever heard of, but also I could very well be wrong, but this was a pretty short trial. There were 400 pieces of evidence presented, video footage of William carrying blood splattered objects from the victim's campsite and crime scene photos shown at the end of the trial. DA Allison Mitchell made one thing clear by saying, quote, he put four victims in the pond and who can shoot a six-year-old? We know who, William Mitchell Hudson. And also, we know he's a psychopath. What more is he capable of? The defense argued that William's crimes were a result of quote-unquote diminished mental capacity brought on by brain injuries and childhood abuse. The thing is, until now, there has never been any evidence of childhood abuse but to continue on, the defense went on to say, quote, with brain injury comes aggression, anger, and impulsiveness. William Hudson was created. He was not born this way. William Hudson will never breathe free air again. Use your eyes, use your brains, and use your judgment to deliberate everything presented, end quote. The jury was implored to consider the death penalty carefully because even if it is allowed in most states, the death penalty is considered to be controversial with Texas death row being the most active. But on the other side of that, it was said to the jurors that the death penalty was about not only the defendant's life, but the lives squandered and stolen by William Hudson's actions. Lisa Tanner of the Texas Attorney General's office then said, quote, he won't change. Blame it on insults to the brain. His personality or a combination, he's not going to change. He is a narcissistic, unrepentant psychopath. He will always be a danger to society, end quote. And I'm sorry, I know I try to leave my bias out of this, but I have to agree with her because I saw the pictures of him and he was, he was smirking. How could you murder a six-year-old and an entire family, no less, and be smirking about that? Like there's something wrong with you. 
These statements, along with the evidence and nature of the crime, would prove to be compelling enough to convince the jury to come to a final decision. Because, as of November 7, 2017, the jury of eight women and four men, as well as two alternates, deliberated for all of 17 minutes to convict William Mitchell Hudson of capital murder. He is sentenced to death by lethal injection. He is currently awaiting an execution date. We spoke briefly earlier on Mariah Guerin, who manages the North Texas Airstream community where the Johnsons had lived. She said that the community woodworking shop that Carl Johnson loved will be dedicated to him. And 12 live oaks have been planted nearby in his honor, which I think is really cool. Wow, Emerald, what a case. Once again, thank you for the suggestion, and we hope we did it justice for you and the family and friends of the victims. And of course, Cynthia, the survivor. Before we wrap up today's episode, there's a friendly reminder that we will be at the 2023 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas. That's August 25th through 27th. Come see us or else. We are still accepting hugs, though. Maybe. Possibly. I don't know. Depends on how I'm feeling that day. There will be a ton of great people there and you do not want to miss out. It is a blast and you get to be around advocates, true crime content creators like Eric Carter Londine and PNW Haunts and Homicides, which is our PNW Haunts and Homies, basically. I don't know. But yeah, that and many other super cool creators. And tickets are for sale at truecrimepodcastfestival.com and we will have stuff to give away. Be sure to use code BEES, that's B-E-E-S, for a discount at checkout. Also, please don't forget that we're poor and we do have a Patreon chock full of bonus content such as our Not So Nefarious Criminals podcast. Guys, we just surpassed 30 episodes of that. Just so you know, that was with Sarai of Freaky AF. Our next episode at the time of recording this will be with CJ from Beyond the Rainbow. So yeah, each week we have a guest and we somehow always forget that we have a guest. But we talk about the lighter side of crime, such as the Florida man. We also evidently talk about weird Facebook scams and the like. It's a great time and a great palate cleanser. You also get to hear archived content that we chose to take off the public feed. So go join the Patreon, starting at only $3 a month. That's significantly less than a monthly rent or mortgage payment. So no more excuses, y'all. Join the damn Patreon. Good talk. By the way, Carl Johnson, Cade, KJ Johnson, Austin and Nathan Camp, Hannah Johnson, Thomas Camp, all bees. And also our badass survivor bee, Cynthia Johnson. She's protecting her own and speaking for those that no longer can speak for themselves as she should. Justice, we believe, was served properly in just 17 minutes and live oaks were planted in the names and memory. As a reminder, bees are strong, resilient, yet vulnerable. We must protect the bees at all costs. For without bees, we as humans are doomed. So be vigilant for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Music used in the theme was originally recorded by Ghost Stories Incorporated, remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Finner and Amanda Cronin. This podcast is a Cloud 10 podcast managed by Sim Sarna, Sahiba Krieger, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. You can help us grow our show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. Thank you, and as always, be vigilant.